Farming or urban gardening is the practice of cultivating, processing and distributing of food in or around urban areas. This week on The Ghanaian Farmer, we introduce you to the concept of urban farming. My name is Enyanam. Get Interactive on our social media platform on Facebook, LinkedIn and on YouTube, The Ghanaian Farmer. This program is proudly brought to you by Lizzie Tomato Mix. It gives your meal a great taste. And as the festive season draws closer, remember to go to the market, shop and buy any of the sites. You will be a distributor. Contact the numbers on your screen and it will be delivered to your doorstep. I'm going for a quick bit that when I come back, we would get into urban farming. There is more after this. Stay tuned. Thanks for staying with us. If you just tuned in, you're watching The Ghanaian Farmer on Joy Prime Television. My name is Enyanam and today's discussion is focusing on urban farming. Seated next to me is Felix Apia. He's the founder of Trisolis and it's mainly about urban farming. So he's going to tell us more that we need to know about this kind of idea or concept. Uh, Mr. Apia, thanks for joining us. You're welcome, madam. What is the meaning of urban farming? Urban farming is mostly when people grow with the available land or resources around their vicinity that they stay in immediate environment so you don't need to go to your farm behind your house in your flower bed in your pot you can still grow something that is urban farming is there a difference between urban farming and traditional farming traditional farming is where people use the sort of uh, old method of uh, processing they don't use tractors they don't use all these implements they use the same hoe and cutlass and all that that's traditional mm. but when it comes to urban farming it doesn't mean it's new it's just it can also be traditional farming though but it's just a subset of farming where people don't go to the farm to do commercial like larger quantities but you can still do in your house i know people who are even producing for other people in their own house carrots a lot of them they do vertical farming where they have put car tires on top of each other and still raising a lot of carrots in their house interesting do we have types of urban farming or urban gardening yes we have some that are fully automated and then some that are just mm -hmm. manual, mm -hmm. yes. So that's the difference, basically. Which type do you have here? We have the fully automated one and the manual one because we do the boxes approach and then we also do the one that has irrigation and has uh, all these uh, technologies and cameras in there that we use to monitor the snow. So we are doing a mixture of both. Okay. What we see behind us is more of like a greenhouse urban farming. What is the size of a land that an individual requires to have this structure? Okay, so you are looking at about 7 meters by 5, which uh, in actual sense, some places is about a quarter of a plot. So if you divide your plot into 4 or 5 divisions, you can use one for this particular setup. Alright, so let's get into the process. After I have my structure, take me through the process before whatever crops or animal it is I want to rear. I bring them in. Take me through the process. Okay, so a client shows his intent or her intent that they want to build. And then we start by fabricating everything here. So we have people who weld, who uh, cut the metal, who do all the preparations. And then we come to your house or your backyard and then we set it up for you. We grow the feed in there. So we grow the taro, the sweet potatoes, the uh, boko boko leaves and all that and the purples in there for you so that the snails can have additional feed. And if it is the vegetables that you want, we also build that and then put the flower or the beds or the buckets in there, fill it with coconut peat and then you can start your own farming with that. Yeah. Okay, so before I bring in the snail or before you grow the taro, what do you do to the soil to avoid any form of um, continuous or constant pest infestation? Yes. So with urban farming comes sustainability. And we partner with people like in Shuraba who does the coconut peat. Well, we get his coconut peat, add it to the soil, make sure that it's very sustainable and also fluffy enough for the snails to be able to dig in. And that increases the penetration of the plants 
make sure that their roots get very good uh, penetration so that they grow faster basically so that is the process that it goes through we treat the soil we also fumigate with natural remedies like uh, a neem tree oil we do uh, amonchi or the uh, black soup we have certain remedies that we use that drive away pests and diseases so we first treat the soil and then add a little bit of fluffiness to the soil by adding the coconut peat and then it will be ready for the planting and the snails yeah. all right so i realized that you have snail hair and then apart from the snail, I saw sweet potato, taro, I saw pawpaw, and even banana. Why do you have all of this in addition to the snail? What relevance or essence does it do for the snail? Okay, so we are trying to mimic the natural environment as much as possible because very soon, whether we like it or not, snails will become extinct because the forest is getting depleted, runoff of uh, pesticides, uh, galamse, the whole lot, everything, sun weaning, all these are affecting the snails. So we are providing a natural remedy or canopy. So the first canopy is the banana that provides shade. And also when it, it grows, it's a dwarf banana, so it grows up to about less than uh, two meters and then it fruits. So the fruits come down and the snail have access to that. The taro, it grows and the leaves also serve as a food for the snail and serve as a, a second canopy. And the sweet potatoes too, the leaves are sustenance for the snails and also a place for them to hide as well. So we've done a mixture of uh, housing units and feed in a combination to make sure that the snails are able to get all these resources and make it sound like a natural remedy as much as possible or a natural environment as much as possible. Mm. Yeah. Another thing I want to know is that the structure itself, yeah. how much does an individual need to put together to be able to have all of this that you mentioned? Okay, so the structure has a breakdown or a package. Okay. So we don't want the client going to buy their own snails where they lose it or they ask someone to build it and they don't really do it. So we do all that package for 24000 for the small setup, which is 5 meters by 7 meters. So that space can hold about 10,000 snails. And then we price that at 24,000 CDs. It comes with a poly tank, a 1,000 liter poly tank, a poly tank stand. It comes with a 1,000 snails. Even the snails alone, one is six CDs. So the snails alone is 6,000 CDs. And once you take that one out, you are having about just uh, uh, 14 to 15,000 CDs in terms of uh, what we are using to buy materials to set up the client. That's a lot of money for a startup. However, let's look at the maintenance of the structure. If you put this together for me, how long do I need to take or will it take me to start repairing or fixing things on the structure okay so our setups are very good especially the net we import from israel so this is engineered net it can last for about 10 years or a decade and then the metal you know that metal so far as it doesn't rust if you paint it it will still remain as strong and uh durable as it is you know for a long time so we estimate the lifespan of this particular uh, project to be about 10 years and then we have other setups that we do for people like the blocks set up we also have small boxes which are mobile units that people use to raise their own snails so you don't necessarily go into this if you don't have the capacity so we have stages or different packages that we can provide and every pocket can come and then we can do that for them okay i want to ask about the kind of weather that this style of farming is, is suitable for it because the open field you can control it yeah. there's the sun is coming the rain is coming and everything so what kind of weather best suits this style of farming the interesting thing is that this is all kind of weather okay. even israel which is a desert country is now growing one of the best uh, strawberries and exporting a lot of vegetables because of the greenhouse mm -hmm. so the also that is that even people close to the sea who could not plant anything because the soil has salt in there mm -hmm. these you are growing in buckets so you bring the soil or the substrate from wherever you want it, coconut peat, you put them in buckets and you can grow. So we are encouraging people to go into the greenhouse farming mm. because it is better and it doesn't really uh, require a lot of things to be right okay. before you can do it because it's a controlled environment. You determine the soil type, you determine the nutrients, you determine the plant and you determine 
um, the amount of air coming in to circulate and you determine the amount of rains that you want in the setup yeah, this is what we call you are in charge yes <laughs> about watering i realize you have tubes all around and you told me you open the taps as and when how often do you open the taps to get water you know in and around the farm so as part of our, our checks we come to your site we check your soil we know that this soil is uh, loamy sandy this is that this is that it means that it retains more so uh, water or moisture content or not so depending on the type of soil you have that would determine the amount of times you water in a day some water once every three days some water once sometimes some people don't even water especially those in the forest areas because the place is already moist so we do this setup make it autonomous some people are even making it automated that they sit in their houses or in their office and then the alarm goes off it's time to water and then you water okay. so that's the why we having the tubes around the tubes are able to regulate the moisture content that goes into the soil so it rains it sort of does the rain effect mm. so all the plants in there have substance and the snails as well okay yeah. Right, so viewers, this is still the Ghanaian farmer. My name is Enyonam. I'm tea chatting with Felis Apia. He's the founder for Trisolis. Trisolis. It's an urban style of farming. And if you want one, they would come and get it fixed for you. We are going for a quick breather. Stay tuned. There's more after this. <laughs> Thanks for staying. This program is proudly brought to you by Lizzy Tomato Mix. And uh, get interactive on our social media platform. Share your views, send us your questions, and we'll be glad to attend to them. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Ghanaian Farmer. So, Felix, you kept mentioning cocoa pits. Cocoa pits. How important is cocoa pits to this kind of farming? Or why are you not talking about the normal soil we have and you're stressing on cocoa pit? Okay. So the normal type of soil has sometimes favorable uh, conditions for you. But here's the case that the normal soil get depleted of nutrients, of color, of texture, of everything. So in the beginning of farming, you can find that if you pick a soil, a bulk of soil, it has all the good nutrients, all the good uh, properties, basically. And then now you drain that because there's water always coming through and the water keeps, uh, keeps uh, going down, seeping the nutrients and the color down. So it changes and then now the soil can kick up, become solid mm. and trap all the, 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 uh, the roots of the plants in there. But coconut pit is fibrous. Mm. It, it, it is spongy. So it allows even the most uh, soft hair, hair roots mm -hmm. to even penetrate and go everywhere okay. that you want. And if you take a plant like carrot, carrot, whenever carrot meets rocks, mm. it splits and becomes so unfavorable that okay. people don't buy it. Right. But if it is smooth, mm. it can go and you have the most beautiful carrot because of the coconut pit. Mm. Because it's fibrous, it actually allows the plant to take their own shape mm -hmm. whenever they want it. But soil can have a bit of uh, resistance mm -hmm. to the plants okay. every day. Yeah. All right. Uh, can farmers, the traditional farmers, the open field style of farming, can they also use the cocoa pit? Yes. So as part of conditioning soil, people think that it's only adding fertilizer that is means con con uh, like uh, conditioning the soil. No, it's not. So conditioning can be anything, improving the water uh, uh, retaining property of the soil, improving the sponginess, doing all those systems can be. And coconut pits are easy to come by. You can get uh, the ones like Inshraba is doing, or you can even grind your own mm. and then do on your own field, add it to the soil. And you can also use other substitutes like uh, uh, wood shavings or the one we call sawdust. Mm -hmm as part of that so you measure the quantities of soil and the soil that you mix it and uh, it becomes so favorable now it becomes spongy and loose mm -hmm. and then you can use it for virtually any other uh, systems that you want so they can use that okay. as well after putting together this for me planting the taro and everything and then bringing in my snail or whatever it is that i want to grow do i need any special form of training to be able to maintain it or uh, manage it in your absence so for the training mm -hmm. It can take you from zero mm -hmm. to expert okay. in just a day. Okay. 
okay. Because we do troubleshooting just for the structure. Mm. For the snails, we will teach you how to raise them. In just a day, you can know all there is to know about snails. So it's just the structure that if the sprinkler is not working, this is what you do to wash it out. This is how you blow it out. This is how you set it so that it, it sprinkles by itself at this time, at that time. So just a day. Mm. You'll be an expert in just a day. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, the greenhouse project or this urban farming, uh, are there any challenges that come with it? What, what makes it difficult or easy to, to manage? Okay, so with the barrier to entry, basically we are just looking at cost mm -hmm. or financing. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, most farmers cannot afford this type of farming uh, because of the cost associated with this one. So what we, we are looking at is that one, with the technology comes cost because bees are not made in Ghana. We have to import them, import taxes, etc., etc. All that makes sure that the prices go up. We use metal so that it becomes very durable and lasts for up to about a decade. So with the metal means cost as well. So the only uh, downside to this is cost, mm. basically, because automation, mm. you need cost. Okay. Uh, electricity, water, all that is about cost, cost, mm. cost, cost. Mm. Do you see urban farming or backyard garden as an end to food security or hunger? Is it, is it a solution to food security and also a solution to ending hunger? Let's go back to 1970s, 1980s. My grandpa would just go to his backyard, take coconut leaves, uh, cocoa yam leaves, taro, mm -hmm. and just come and put it on his food. Mm -hmm. And after that, he grinds it. That is the same thing we are doing, just that now we have concrete jungles. Okay. We don't have the, the same soil they used to have, but we can condition our soil to do that. So, yes, we can do that. It's a form of uh, way that we're going to alleviate mm -hmm. poverty. Mm -hmm. Just recently, we harvested carrots here, and I was able to eat that for the whole of a week. Mm -hmm. You know, I used some for other uh, stew mm -hmm. sauces, and then I, was, I didn't go out to buy. That means that I've actually decrease the competition of someone getting that carrot that I would have bought. Mm. And then me making it in my backyard, make sure that Ghana gets money internally. Okay. And then we can also generate food to solve all our hunger issues. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we are still talking about urban farming or urban gardening. I'm sure up to this level, you have got a lot of point on why to consider going into this. If you have a space in your house, you'd want to start or convert it into a backyard garden. Coming up at 60 seconds on agri, let's get to know what is trending in the agricultural sector. When we come back, we'll be wrapping up on this discussion. But remember to get interactive, turn your questions and views on our social media platform, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and YouTube, The Ghanaian Farmer. I'll be right back after this. So gone by was 60 seconds on our great years to watching the Ghanaian farmer. My name is Zanyunam and I have Mr. Apia with me here. Mr. Apia, backyard gardening, urban farming, urban gardening doesn't have also any challenge. Does it create any nuisance to the environment in which the person is going to do it? Does it pose any environmental problem or challenges to the people, your neighbors or anything like that? Okay, with that question, let's look at someone who has gotten enough money to set up a house, has tiled his whole compound, 
basically because he didn't want that. And now he wants to do urban farming. The best he can do for the environment is do this, create a lot of vegetation. It increases the oxygen in the place. It increases the amount of humidity, makes sure that the place is very cool or cold so the person can stay and be very comfortable. So in terms of nuisance, like I said, if you are doing something like poultry or any other thing in urban setting, that is where it becomes a nuisance. Okay. Snails do not smell or make noise. Okay. Vegetables do not smell or make noise. Okay. So they so actually add the kind of urban farming that you wish okay. to do. So urban farming, like like I said, poultry or piggery or anything like that, will cause EPA problems. Okay. People will uh, report, you. report you to the authorities mm -hmm. and all that. But with our niche, which is the snails, mm -hmm. The vegetables and maybe something as subtle as uh, ra uh, uh, rabbits mm -hmm. and other things like that. You can do You're it, yes, on the low key settings and be. So far as you put safety measures in place, mm -hmm. there's very little. Like I said, when you are entering, mm -hmm. you yourself as a farmer, you know that I wear this outside, so I don't need to wear it mm -hmm. inside. I change my shoes, mm -hmm. I change this, mm -hmm. so that the biohazard you are creating is minimum, okay. so that you don't breed any. Uh, uh, biosecurity threats okay. to the environment yes okay um do you have weeds growing in there and if you do how do you go about clearing them because i see a lot of crops and including snail how do yeah. i ensure that i don't break or kill any of the snail whilst trying to uproot all this grass okay so let's take a typical setting mm -hmm. like under the cocoa farm mm -hmm. so under the cocoa farm it, it is so conducive yet very subtle that other plants do not grow because of the canopy. Mm -hmm. So other plants need sunlight. Mm -hmm. But because we have created certain levels of canopy, it makes sure that there are not so much weeds mm -hmm. at the very bottom of it. So the snails have a conducive environment. The, cocoa, uh, the sweet potato vines, mm -hmm. they climb up to onto the nets, mm -hmm. making sure that they get sunlight as well. But for leaves, no. And for weeds, no. We don't have weeds because of the canopy okay. it cuts out the sunlight mm -hmm. making sure that everything doesn't grow N most things do not grow okay. under the canopy okay. yeah in the traditional farming we have the uh, minor season and the major season and so within this two period the land gets some space to rest before another season takes over uh with your style of farming uh do you also have seasons or you can grow all year round with ours, you play God, sort of, because you determine when it rains. Mm -hmm. So you give water, you give nutrients, you give uh, acidity level, you reduce it. It's based on you in particular. So we do not have seasons. Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of it because you control the weather in that environment. So you want it to rain, you turn on your sprinklers. You do this, you do that. So our system is also very efficient that we can grow all year round, okay. making sure that we do very little water, mm. we do very little nutrients, and sometimes as organic as possible. Mm. And then that is the awesome nature of greenhouse okay. for Ghana. You, yeah. you awesome nature. Uh, my, my last but one question is that uh, considering the amount of money you mentioned, if I want to have this type of structure and then start my um, urban farming or urban gardening, it, it's quite an amount of money for a startup or somebody who wants to have this all alone. But uh, does it bring any profit? Um, will I make some returns if I invest money into this? And if I'll make returns, what do you advise that if I want to do this commercial, what and what crop do you advise or animal do you advise I start with so that in the nearest, shortest time, I can recoup the money I've invested into. In terms of crops and uh, uh, what to grow, uh, in terms of animals as well, we would recommend snails because obviously we are doing snails. Mm -hmm. And snails do not smell or make noise. Mm -hmm. So you can put them any, in any settings and be very uh, good. And snails are hermaphrodites. Mm -hmm. So each individual will lay eggs and they will give you a lot of eggs. Mm -hmm making sure that you get a lot of profit so you can eat some, sell some, and these are commercial structures that we do for snails. So for vegetables, I tell people that always get the market first. So you go to all the supermarket and tell them, I have a structure, I want to do 
uh, this particular plant or what do you want me to do usually i've seen people grow carrots mm. because it is in the coconut pit is one of the most beautiful uh specimens you can get because they don't get impeded other people use soil and they have all these carrots with different ends and it doesn't look beautiful but our setup with the coconut pit make sure that it's excellent for you to grow carrots in particular cucumbers as well and because it is an all year round thing you can grow pepper and be so profitable chili or bell? bell both bell and chili now pepper is so expensive on the market mm. because the rains did not we didn't get regular rains right we, because we didn't get regular rains it means that now you do pepper and you become very profitable so that's the awesome nature of it Right, so we are wrapping up our interview. Now, behind off, or off camera, you mentioned how much uh, money goes into this. And you are trying to create employment. You are helping, healthy eating, and a few other things that is very, very good for our economy. Is there any form of help you would need from government or private sector? Okay. So we found out that there's a lot of people who have farms and need credible uh, intelligent sort of people to run it or uh, knowledgeable people to run it but we are also seeing a lot of people who are unemployed some in agri and etc who do not have jobs so we are looking at the coercion between these two we want to set up a school which will train people in new technologies like greenhouses mm -hmm. and all that but we don't have the uh, capacity resources. and resources to build their hostel facilities and all that. We are in the middle of that so man here and look at what we have been able to do. This setup alone gives us around uh, uh, 1.2 million CDs every year. Mm -hmm. And then this is a small environment. So imagine the, the possibilities mm -hmm. of what we can do. And a lot of people have stopped farming because they do not have credible people to man their farm. So we are thinking that we can create an informal uh, a Greek extension officers okay. who are not quote and unquote having degrees but okay. can still go to smaller farms and be able to man their farms, use new technologies and be able to help these farms. Mm -hmm. So this is what we are we are looking out for, that we get help in uh, setting up a curriculum, setting up a school, a facility that can train all these people and they can in turn man other people's farm, mm -hmm. creating more employment, mm -hmm. food security mm -hmm. and availability and also increasing the GDP as yeah. well. Sure. No need for me to add more because they said it all. And so if you're out there, whether you're in Abrochre or you're here in Ghana and you love this concept, you want to give it a try or you want to have further conversation with Felix, you can just get in touch with the Ghanaian farmer and we'll connect you to Felix so you can sit down and have a business chat. I always encourage people that, listen, when you're dealing with an elite person who understands business like Felix does, you don't have problem investing because you are sure of your return. So that makes it up for our interview today on Urban Farming. My guest, Felix Apia, if you're looking forward to meeting him or discussing further with him about this concept, just reach out to the Ghanaian Farmer on all our social media platform. Next week, we'll see you again with another insightful interview. Until then, it's a bye for now.